Mike Bledsoe here, CEO of the Shrug Collective. If you haven't already noticed, we've got a lot of new cool stuff going on. If you hit shrugcollective.com, you'll see some great content that you won't be catching if you're only listening to the podcast. Hit the website and see the new look and feel. This week, we get to introduce you to two new shows. Today, we bring you Body of Knowledge. This show has been created by a couple of guys you already know, Dr. Andy Galpin and Kenny Kane. They've had their own project, and I love that we get to share it with you here. As we're expanding and improving the shows, we have partnered with amazing companies that we believe in. We talk and hang out with the people who run these businesses and know why they do what they do. Not all products are created equal, even if it looks like it on the surface. We've done the research and have been in the industry long enough to see what really works and what will make the biggest difference for you long term. With that being said, one of my favorite companies, Thrive Market has a special offer for you. You get $60 of free organic groceries, plus free shipping, and a 30-day trial. Go to thrivemarket.com body. This is how it works. Users will get $20 off their first three orders of $49 or more, plus free shipping. No code is necessary because the discount will be applied at checkout. Many of you will be going to the store this week anyway, so hit up Thrive Market today. Thrivemarket.com body. Enjoy the show. Um, can we start again? Yeah. Where's the future of this understanding going? Don't know. Why? Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> We are not a singular thing. We are built to change. At the most advanced levels of everything, it comes down to fundamental basics. These are general health practices that every human should be striving for. It's candy madness. Scream if you like candy. I don't know where that came from. I wasn't listening. I was just thinking about that. Good people, I'm Kenny Kane alongside Andy Galpin, and this is the Body of Knowledge with awesome stories at the intersection of science and fitness. Today on the show, we address a big question. Is your physiology something you can build or are you born with it? Now, recently, boy, the, the needles kind of moved. People do know that you can, you can build a lot of your physiology, but to what degree? And today, man, we're going to be getting into that with old ninja uh, Dr. Pants next to me, uh, Dr. Galpin. Now, to anchor this whole conversation with it, it is this philosophical idea that Thomas Kuhn in the 60s wrote a book about. Now, it might be one of the most boring books ever constructed, <laughs> yet the ideas in it massively influential. So if there's a listener or several out there that can read the entire book, I want to guarantee that we're going to give illegally the fire hydrant that rests outside <laughs> of this gym that we're currently recording and and a free puppy. So you're going to get a puppy and a fire hydrant for getting through that book. The, the title of the book is The Structure of Scientific Revolution. Now, in that book, Thomas Kuhn coined the phrase that has been totally overplayed, the paradigm shift. Now, what he Are said- Are you saying though, our show's not going to cause a paradigm shift? Because I think we're going to cause a shift. We might cause a paradigm shift. I don't think we're going to cause a shift. And it will be the most played thing ever because <laughs> we have followed something that lost flavor in vernacular 15 years ago. Nonetheless, in the 60s, when he created this, it was brand new language. And what he's talked about is he said, look, the- the way to think about science is not so much as these deep scientific spikes and then that changes the world irrevocably. Rather, it's the way in which you view things and challenge things. So and that's mm -hmm. that's why he said it's, the, it's a series of paradigm shifts that evolve and move the whole thing forward. And when, he mentioned in the book, these paradigm shifts occur, there is typically a tremendous about amount of kickback and resistance. So mm -hmm. we can all sort of understand, empathize, and relate to, mm -hmm. hey, you've got an idea and people around you go, that's scary, that's new, that's free whatever certainly i've seen it 
a lot as a coach. I see a ton of closed mindedness uh, and people mm-hmm. holding to their ideas. I do it personally myself. Mm-hmm. As a scientist uh, off air, you and I have talked about this, that it's endemic in the scientific community for right. people to hold on to their ideas as if they are absolute truths. Mm-hmm. Fundamentally, what we want this show to be about is the evolution of ideas, knowing full well that what we think is going to constantly evolve with some degree of plasticity. Hmm. Plasticity. One of the interesting things that we're going to talk about. Why? Because muscle, as we know it, turns out to be pretty darn plastic in its ability to evolve. To what degree? We're going to dive into that uh, a ton. But let me just start this episode with our producer, who is a 230-pound beefcake gorilla, Josh Ambry, who has got a football playing background and an Olympic lifting background. So the guy can propel, you know, mid 300 and something pounds overhead really without thinking about it. And recently he came to the gym and I noticed a massive evolution in his oxidative capacities. In Mm -hmm. other words, his ability to uh, perform exercise without fatiguing for a long time. Dramatically improved. Yeah. And uh, case in point, he had a test workout that he failed to complete that had a 35-minute cap. So this means he had to get it done in less than 35 minutes or no matter – even if he wasn't done, no matter where he was in the workout, you stopped him after 35 minutes. Right. And after yeah. three months of training, he finished that workout in 28 minutes. Right. So That's uh, 20% or more. That's 20% or more in three months. Yeah. So – You know, again, a lot of people really do recognize that there is this ability to gain fitness in different areas. Mm -hmm. But I understand that principally, but I would love your help in understanding that more specifically. Well, so let me ask you then, how much strength did he lose during that time? So it took him three months and he got better. Uh, How far did it down his squat go? That is a great question. Josh, what did you... Absolutely none. none. My, My strength didn't improve, but it stayed the same. My, my front squat was identical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what's interesting about that, because we're actually hearing that a lot right now, mm-hmm. uh, you've, you've got hundreds of cases, thousands of, of cases, coaches around the world, people from different, from different areas are, are saying, wait a minute, we used to think you either got strong or you got in shape. And there's no middle ground. In fact, we used to think there was an interference effect. And there probably is to some degree, but we've got to tease out exactly what's going on there. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, I would point you to a really nice article wrote by a good friend of mine, Dr. Jimmy Bagley, on, on this concept of concurrent training. But what it really does is it outlines we've got more plasticity or adaptability in this example in our muscle than we ever thought. To really understand that, we've got to go all the way back to the beginning of our understandings of how muscle contraction works. A Greek physiologist named Aristotelus came up with this concept. <laughs> Wait, what was his name? Aristotelus. I'm so glad that you can Isn't say that. Isn't that your son's name? Aristotelus. Oh, Aristotelus. no. no. Ar- <laughs> it took me a lot of time on Wikipedia with the Google pronunciation function to try to finally learn how to say that name. When you're giving uh, lectures at Cal State Fullerton, do you have to do you, do you talk to him by, uh, refer to him by name? Yeah, I do, and it just goes right over my student size. They don't care. Aristotelus. Yeah, most of them don't care about any of this mm. stuff. But when they, when they, when they, you, when they do, remember the name. You know what you give them: a fire hydrant, or a fake mustache, or a fake mustache, <laughs> a glue on mustache, a glue specifically. on mustache, right? So Aristotelus came up with this idea of that he called spiritus animalis, mm-hmm. which is talk about another fun book to read. <laughs> Good luck, right? Mm -hmm. But what he really did was... It's all Greek to me. Yeah, literally. He was trying to figure out how muscle contraction happens. So why is it when I flex my bicep, the muscle literally gets larger vertically, right? And so he came up with this working theorem that connected the cardiovascular, neuromuscular, and, and muscular system. And what he basically thought was there was this pneuma or breath or this spirit, right, that's in all animals. And so when you wanted to contract your bicep, you would send this wave of air from your brain through what ended up being your nervous system to the muscle. The, the, this uh, air, like pneumatics, right, this is where the word pneumatics comes right. from, air fills that space. This is why the muscle gets larger. This concept of muscle contraction via spiritus animalis uh, persisted for several thousand years. Until, if I have it somewhat correct, this thing called the microscope comes along and there's this crazy advancement in the technology of the microscope. It's exactly right. In 1712, uh, a gentleman by the name of 
Anthony von Leeuwenhoek. Von Leeuwenhoek. He came back and he had he used this massive advancement in technology and it was that allowed him to actually look a lot closer at the individual muscle fibers and he actually he was looking at whale and cod and he was able to look under this new microscope that he had um, made significant improvements in and he started to realize that there's not air filling muscles there's these actual individual muscle fibers and so the contractile force or the the function of your bicep is really dictated by how all these thousands or millions of individual muscle fibers perform. So that single fiber function determines whole muscle function. So somewhere around 150 years later, I remember you telling me that this whole thing started to advance because some guy was able to, to look at muscle fibers and go, they look a lot different. Yeah, that's right. Uh, a guy by the name of Ron Vier, who we'll come back to later in, in later episodes. Uh, he's the guy where we get the term the nodes of Ron Vier, which are the spaces between your myelin sheath, which is your insulation on your nerves. Also a great song that never got released by Adele. Yeah, probably. Probably. <laughs> it's her next hit. Yeah. So Ron Vier quickly realized that some of these muscle fibers were meant to do things like be on all day, but to produce a low amount of force, right? These are are, our muscles like the back of your leg or your low back muscles to keep you vertical, the anti-gravity muscles. But some of them are meant to produce a tremendous amount of force, uh, but they fatigue quickly, right? And this, these, these fibers are around to help you do things like rip a fire hydrant off the front of Kenny's wall so <laughs> to give away to people, <laughs> right? So we, we've got this independent function, and this led to a whole new area of study. So is that where this thing that, you know, between actin and myosin starts to kick in, our understanding of that? Yeah, that's exactly right. So once we had this steam built from Ron VA, the next big advancement we had came in, in 1954 when a pair of uh, of scientists named Huxley and Huxley, which, by the way, isn't it crazy? They they had this massive discovery together. Their both last names are Huxley, and they're not related. That's um, I'm going to qualify that as rare. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. But nonetheless, um, what what they outlined in their series of papers in 1954 was this relationship uh, explaining the exact mechanics of a single muscle fibers contraction. So uh, it's something you could look up perhaps in your own, this idea of, of actin and myosin. So myosin being a very big molecule that reaches up and it grabs the actin, which are smaller molecules around it. It pulls them together. And so the muscle fibers start stacking vertically on each other, which gives you that size. And so what it really does is explain in more accurate terms or improve knowledge all the way back to the NUMA idea. I said, you know what, you weren't entirely off. We do have a signal coming from the brain, and it's going through some area. It's weaving its way to the exact muscle. And there's a respiratory process involved. Absolutely. An energetic process. Absolutely. But now the mechanics of it are improved. And what's probably really interesting, perhaps we'll come back to this in another episode or another season, is this whole concept of sliding filament theory. While we know it is far improved over the pneuma and the spirit of silent malice, uh, we still realize there's some problems there. So that's not as airtight as we had thought. So let's get to the heart of this whole thing. I mean, you're, you're setting a great foundation right now for us to understand sort of the history of uh, muscle muscle fibers. But help me understand, Andy, like the plasticity of muscles. I yeah. mean, can wh why is it that Josh can improve so dramatically and not lose strength or explosivity, yeah. yet cart around that giant carcass that he's got. <laughs> it's a beautiful carcass, it is. but it's a giant one. It's a giant carcass, gi yeah. giant tattooed carcass. So once we realize that we have, we understand how muscle fibers are contracting and we understand some fibers are built to do different things, the next obvious question then was, okay, how much of these fiber types are determined by my genetics? And how much of these things change, or do they change? And pe people will just dig their heels in on this until they die. Absolutely, and then they're generally the people that don't do the research. Mm. They're not the actual people doing these studies. Because we've known actually for a very, very long time the answer, and in fact, it, it's, it's not even arguable anymore. But somehow people that don't read actual things <laughs> want to make this argument. Right. So here's what we basically know, is... Unlike in animals, uh, humans are very unique in the fact that none of our muscles are homogenous with this fiber type, which is a fancy way of saying if we take up, uh, Kenny, pick your favorite muscle. 
Glutes. The glutes. Of course, you'd pick Love glutes. the glutes. Because yours are so delicious. I got you glowing have tasty orbs. <laughs> I'm 163 pounds of it, uh, and I would say that 45 That's your finest feature? are in my glutes. Mm, fantastic. So if we take your glutes. Gives me strumpf. Right. Uh, th- we know the main function of the glute is actually uh, to to be a little bit of both in terms of it is necessary to be on at a low level for a large portion of the day. That mm-hmm. stabilizes your hip, keeps your pelvis mm-hmm. Uh, and your low back in in neutral position. But it's also meant to generate a lot of force production, right? This is a massive external rotator of your femur, Mm -hmm. and it propels you forward, causes tremendous hip extension. It's important. And so if we look at its fiber type, it's probably a little bit of a mix. It probably has some of these slow, and it probably has some of these fast fibers Mm -hmm. in it, right? Now, if you compare your glute and my glute, though, it's entirely possible in fact it'd be almost guaranteed that that percentage of fast versus slow in your glutes is going to differ in mine right and so not only do we have different fiber types within a muscle group but then we also have massive person-to-person variability in our composition if we go back to josh too his composition might be different so we're all three probably further down the anaerobic strength power spectrum than the average person but if we compare that to say your wife who is an olympic level uh distance runner well mid distance runner right She's probably a little bit further down the endurance spectrum, and if we compare that to uh, an Olympic marathoner or even a normal person who just likes to do continuous steady-state exercise who would have had no problem beating Josh's ass in that first 30-minute workout, right, they may be further down the slow twitch end of the spectrum. So we've got this massive variability between person and between muscle. Once we realized that and we started studying this even more, we actually started to understand it's not even that clean. What I mean by that is... Just like when we had this massive advancement in technology, the microscope, we had this massive improvement in knowledge. The same thing happened with our fiber types about 30 years ago. We had a massive improvement in our laboratory's technical skills, and we started to realize not only are there fast and slow fibers, but there are some even further down the spectrum, which are now what we call ultra-fast. There's not only fast, slow, and super-fast. There are some fibers that exist in between each of those categories. So these are individual muscle cells. This is one cell in the body that is some portion fast and some portion slow at the same time. There's two things. One, there's uh, the sort of conversation that everybody knows. The guy or the gal that says, I'm I'm more of a fast twitch. Right. Or or like, I'm I'm a slow twitch. I I don't do that fast stuff. You know, so people have their opinions Mm -hmm. about Mm -hmm. sort of, and, and that might just fit their personalities, let alone what they're exposed to. Then there's the other scientific thing that I'd like to hear more on, which is, as I understand it, the mitochondrial density is the huge distinguishing factor in the fiber types. And that's critical to sort of understand because the application of the sort of volume of mitochondria in uh, the slower twitch fibers Mm -hmm. is much more dense versus the faster twitch. But the faster twitch get energy from different resources. Mm -hmm. So understanding that, I think, ha- helps me understand the sort of physiology of that. But can you t- break that down better than I could for our yeah. listeners? Well, you're exactly right in your first point. A lot of that is determined by the exposure that that person gives themselves. So if I'm a fast twitch guy, it generally means I like it better because I have more success there. So I spend more damn time doing it. Mm-hmm. Right. But what so happens? Human. That's so human. Right. Yeah. What happens if I expose myself to the other end of the spectrum? There is an unprecedented level of plasticity within this. Right. Now to your second point, the mitochondria, which are these independent organelles that are different from you. In fact, they actually have their own, their own individual DNA, by the way, which is crazy. And fun fact, it's inherited entirely by your mother. Well, my mom was a world-class athlete, so. Well, pff, yeah. wow. Must... I, I wasn't. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> might, have been, might have been mindset. <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah, there are more mitochondria in these slow-twitch ones, of course. But there still is, a, the, your fast-twitch have the ability to add more. And we do see this from time to time, although it's not the norm. It's not impossible for us to see a fast twitch fiber that has more, let's say, mitochondria than a slow twitch. That's funny because I, I I was fixed in that thinking yeah. just based on certifications that I had done and studying that I had done at one point. No, okay. absolutely not. We, we don't okay. see any of that. In fact, the more we study these things yeah. with the better technology, we start to realize our knowledge I- is rudimentary. And when we gain better perspective, we start to realize, well, the only reason we saw x or y or z is because that's the only way we could look at it now once we look at it from a better perspective we're seeing holes yeah i just got off on the third floor you're looking at it from the 45th exactly and so 
Uh, these hybrid fibers, which I alluded to a second ago, is another great example of that. And so, you know, just a handful of years ago, um, actually more like a couple of decades ago, we thought there's only fast or slow. And now we realize there's fast and slow, and there's a single cell that can be partially fast or partially slow. It could be 90% fast, 10% slow. And so what it really lets us know is, yeah, we can arbitrarily call Josh a fast switch guy. But more importantly, he's just a guy on a spectrum. There's a continuum of fiber types, and he is just at a certain place on that continuum. And that continuum moves based on a bunch of different things. When I see Josh move sometimes, I think to myself, sometimes he runs slow, sometimes he runs quick. He's sweeter and thicker than a Chico stick. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I wasn't listening. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> Anyway, take me back to the 45th floor. Yeah, right. When we look at some of the original research in these areas, we do realize that, yeah, okay, uh, endurance athletes tend to have more of these slow twitch fibers, and high power strength athletes do have more of these fast twitch fibers. And people kind of stopped carrying that, but that's because we couldn't even see these hybrids. It turns out people who are untrained or sedentary have a lot of these hybrid fibers. Right. And now as soon as you start to train they go away. So is that some sort of epigenetic thing? You're, 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 you're turning on some, some DNA and also just utilizing specific muscle fiber types based on the exposure. Yes. Or, uh, the nature of activity. It's an exposure issue. Doing. Exactly. Now we don't know the details here because we're, again, we're fresh in this field, but one way I could speculate, and, and I, I, by the way, I request full permission to totally change my answer in five or ten years when we figure this out. But right now, my speculation is this. If we took Josh and we sat him on the couch for the next six months, a lot of his fibers, whether they're fast or slow, would convert into being hybrids. Now, after those six months where, let's see, 30 or 40 percent of his muscle fibers are in this hybrid state, we have him start lifting heavy with you. Well, now a lot of those half fast, half slow fibers are going to convert into a fast fiber because now there's a level of specificity of movement needed. If we had exposed him to the other end of the spectrum, they would have probably shifted to slow twitch. It doesn't appear to really matter what you do activity-wise to cause these hybrid fibers to specify, but the key thing is you have to do something. You can worry about the fine-tuning and detailing later, but if you're on the couch right now, if you haven't trained in the last six sure. weeks, six months, six years, just get moving. Right. They will start to move, and you will notice this immediately in form and function. And this is why when we take somebody who's uh, untrained, and it doesn't matter what workout you put them on, after six months, they're going to be bigger, faster, stronger, more powerful, in better shape, oxidation, and you name it, they're going to be better at everything, right? Now, if you're looking at somebody who's highly trained, they probably have very, very low numbers of these hybrids, 10% or less. Right, very low because they're very, very specified, which is one of the reasons probably why it's harder for them to make gains. Well, time out. Highly trained for what? Like, are you, are you talking about a sport, sport specific or fitness specific? Either way. Well, either way. Yeah. If you're very, very trained, if you're engaged in a lot of physical training, those fibers are going to specify. And when you get to the end of that and there's no more room to go, then your progress slows down. Right. Right. That didn't really answer our question, though, because people will always come back and say, Oh, okay, well, what, what if Josh, say, who doesn't have a lot of these hybrids, maybe he chose to do lifting, he chose to play football because he was already born with a lot of these fast twitch. So enter our next conversation, which is to look at really is there, is it able or are you able to change your fiber type with training in a normal, healthy circumstance? And to what degree? Well, again, I would point you to a paper uh, by my good friend, Dr. Jimmy Bagley, who outlined all this stuff, and he took all the studies that have been done on, on um, fiber type change, put it into one figure for you, and it shows a pretty clear change. Whether you're talking about lifting weights for six months, whether you're talking about doing a little bit of lifting and some cardio, whether you're talking about doing the opposite. So this is 60, 90 days of bed rest, mm. right? sitting a um, broken leg or just laying in bed. We see fiber types change in all directions, and in as little as like 14 days. So what happens very, very quick. In fact, a really cool paper just recently came out where they took old and young people and they had them do 14 days, to, days of disuse. And what they found was the fast and slow fibers changed. Just two weeks. In just two weeks, right? And then when they actually followed them through 28 days of active recovery, the fibers changed again. They went back to their normal resting level. 
we know we have this level of plasticity. We know it happens very quick. And in fact, it can even change with things like your, your nutrition and your diet. So a really cool study also came out very recently. They looked at, now, they didn't look at humans. They looked at primates, which are very, very similar in terms of our muscle fiber right. and function. And what they did is they put them either on a long-term high-fat, high-sugar diet, or they got the same thing with a little bit of a phytochemical called resveratrol. And what they saw was, again, a significant change in fiber composition based on that high-fat, high-sugar diet, and the resveratrol was able to block it. Interesting. I think we can stop the conversation about whether or not muscle fibers change. The question really now is, like, what doesn't change them? Really what, the, the, what people want to know, though, is, again, what, can, can we put a number on it, right? Uh, how much do you change? Well, if we're talking about less than a year, right? So, in other words, we take a biopsy. You Kenny, you come down to my lab tomorrow. I stick a needle in there. I suck some of that fine-looking tissue out of you, mm. right? Put it in my lab. Glute, glute meat. Yeah, <laughs> yummy. <laughs> Lots right? of glute meat in the lab. We're probably looking, and if we put you on a training program over a year, we could probably see upwards of a 10, 15, 20% change in your fiber type, which is a big, big, big number. Now, that's substantial because I'm 112 years old. <laughs> right? Well, actually, interestingly, we have done studies upwards of 80 years old or more, and still we don't lose any of these abilities to change fiber types with age. The rate of change slows down, but we still can see fiber type changing in 70, 80 year olds. We don't lose this ability, we just lose movement. Right. right. We stop okay. moving. Mm -hmm. So if you were very, very, very untrained, Kenny, we might see 10, 20% movement in a year. Now, if you're very trained, you might see maybe closer to 5, 6, 7, 8%, depending on the exact details here. But 10, 20, 30% is not completely unreasonable. It's, it's physiologically possible. Somewhere between greater it's, than a year. It's, it's such crazy percentages. It gets even higher. It's crazy. We've seen up to 70%. And, and what, like Now, these are extreme what? cases when you do something like have a spinal cord injury and the nerve is oh. cut for like five, six, seven, ten years. Okay. But what that shows us is there is unlimited plasticity, right? It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of exposure. In those particular cases, the exposure was literally nothing. So we see these huge changes. Can you guess which direction the fiber type shifted in those particular cases? For the people with neuropathies mm -hmm. or spinal injuries? Like if we cut off your nerve for your leg? Uh, well, I would imagine that it would go more type 1 or, or slower twitch. Yeah, it goes the other way. Really? They become almost entirely, not only fast twitch, they become almost entirely ultra fast twitch. Why? Don't know. That's very counterintuitive to Extremely. Me. It's probably because they're shifting towards that ultra fast fiber type because it's more metabolically conservative. Saves energy. Right. We, we think that, that those fibers are then on their way out. They're, they're, it's their exit strategy. So they're about to die. Now I'm getting way out of my lane, but like, can I just throw this out there? There's, like, there's the mitochondrial density with capillary density. And mm -hmm. if somebody's not moving, both of those are going to start correct. to reduce. Totally. Everything. I got one right. Hey. I got one right. Yeah. Uh, let's, Josh, I want myself a mustache. Can we get him his fire extinguisher? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so we, we, we think that maybe that's an, an exit strategy. So the fibers are about to die. They're saying, you haven't used this in a long time, but we're going to hang out here and we're going we're gonna to cancel all capillaries. We're going to cancel all mitochondria. We're going to save energy production. But we will be here in case we do have to rip that fire hydrant off one time. Now, we're, you're only good for one, but we're here. I mean, that's a complete guess. We don't know. Then the hard part is we can't study these ultra-fast fibers because we can never find them because we almost never see them in normal humans. So... Where's the future of this sort of understanding going? Ron VA and all those folks helped us identify that the cell type determined function. Fast twitch, slow twitch, this tells me how it's going to contract. But the next level beyond cell is called the molecule. And so the molecular and the genetic environment determines the actual plasticity. So cell type determines function but molecule determines adaptability. Right. And so we have this in a couple of different directions. Imagine you've got one muscle fiber, one muscle cell. It's got, a, it's got a nucleus inside of it, right? The nucleus is what holds all of your DNA. That's the things you inherit from your, your, your mom and thank you, dad, right? <laughs> so you've got those things, and that's fixed. You can't change that. But how those genes are expressed, which is called epigenetics, that is determined in huge portion by your lifestyle your sleep, your diet, and nutrition, your training in this context. 
So these different molecules within the cell tell your nucleus, we've been stretched, we've been damaged, we've been over-caffeinated, we've been under-sugared, we've been hyper-proteined, whatever happens to happen. So now what our lab and many other labs are looking at is, what are these molecules? Why are they operating this way? Um, one quick example, we've done a recent study where we looked at two different bouts of heavy lifting. Something like 15 sets of three repetitions versus three sets of 15 repetitions. I mean, you and every other coach knows, okay, one of those is going to help me grow a lot of muscle, and one of those, I'll grow a little muscle, but really I'll get stronger, Just powerful. Stronger, yeah. Like, not even close, right? And so my question was, if we know that's the actual outcome, there has to be a molecular explanation for that. And so we were able to identify, yes, there is a different... Let's take two steps back yeah. just for the vantage of the listener. So basically you just described uh, a way to build muscle, which is some volume is going to help with mm -hmm. that. And then to develop some raw strength, a little bit less volume is going to help with that. Yep, agreed. So we just wanted to then come back and say, these are really interesting practitioner coaching questions. There's got to be some cellular, or at this point, molecular, molecular and genetic right. explanation for it. And so, yeah, we, we saw quite a different response at that level. That doesn't tell us what to do, but that is helping us explain why you're seeing what you're seeing on the floor a lot mm -hmm. of the times. So that's really the future. That's where everyone's going with these things. Uh, we're trying to identify this. Now, the, the problem still remains. Were they built with those molecules? Did they have more of those molecules around so they were more sensitive to it? To it? That's probably what explains your classic responder and non-responder. Rise at you and your right. workout buddy, you do the exact same workout, but he gains 20 pounds of muscle and you gain two. Well, he's probably got more of these molecules floating around or the ones he have are more sensitive. So he just responds really, really well. And so we're starting to actually be able to get these answers. And in fact, we have found a bunch of these individual molecules that we can pinpoint and go, you got more of this one around? Okay, you're going to respond really, really well. You have less of it around. You're going to have to work harder. It's going to take more time, or you might need more volume, or you might need less volume. Is that more in the field of epigenetics? I mean, people who are looking at this on cellular and molecular levels. Well, epigenetics and is looking at the gene expression right, level. The gene of expression, it. but which ones are getting opened up mm -hmm. or closed off based on exposures. Yep. And so that's the gene level. You can also look at it at the molecule level because the molecule is what tells the gene what to, whether or not it's been overloaded anyways. But where this is eventually going to go is helping us truly identify individualized training programs. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we're going to be able to answer questions like, why you can need more of a back off than I do, or why you need more volume, or why you can handle these things, or you know what, you, Josh, don't have the, enough of these mechanisms to program for enzymes that produce mitochondria or that work well with mitochondria, so you actually need more of this type of training because you've got an inherent limitation. That's probably what's doing it. And so not only do we have an answer to the question of whether or not these cell types change, they change massively. They change in response to a bunch of different things. And now we know exactly what's causing it, and we see it happening within seconds. So, Dr. Galpin, this, this fires me up uh, for a lot of reasons. One, as a gym owner, one of the things that I'm fundamentally trying to anchor is the improvement of people's quality of life. You know, I understand the, the, the core principles of adaptation and use those the best that, that we can in our group classes. Now, it's way easier to program for somebody one-on-one -on -one where you're just solely focused on somebody and what their specific needs and desires are. That's like th that we don't even necessarily need to know to the degree that you're describing to see massive improvements in people when we're just working with them one-on-one. -on -one. Having said that, the nature of gym communities, for example, work fundamentally as a as a tribe. Yes. So there's yeah. this like individualized thing that's happening within a tribe. And that yeah. that's where personally I would love to see, you know, the evolution of this space go where there's enough communal connection, but then we have such a, a deep understanding of everybody genetically. Um, you know, to put them in the bis best position when they're coming to a group experience that, the, you know, workouts are getting kicked out that are going to help them respond best in the trajectory that we're trying to get them to go, if it, that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's not the scientists leading the cart here. And it's not the practitioners either. This right. is why we work together. So 
with this integrated science, as it starts to come to us, we can sort of ensure as gym owners, coaches, trainers, that we're giving our people mm. great stuff to yeah. improve their overall health, knowing that part of that health equation is the camaraderie mm. and that depth of human connection that is requisite for people living well. So while the muscle stuff is important, there's more than just that there is and that's fundamentally like what what i'm after as a gym owner is like yeah. really dialing down and, and and anchoring into that because i've seen some situations where like the communal tribal experience is just wonderfully dynamic and profound and it keeps mm -hmm. people coming back but unfortunately there's misapplication of to me very basic principles so you, right, in other words right. you, in, you like unintentionally injure large volumes of people just by malpractice or not really knowing or right. doing the work to know. And so to me, like the ultimate is where they're integrated, integrated really, really well, where people are seeing, uh, you know, their, their, their bell curves continue to go up across their fitness, mm -hmm. but then their, their connection and their basic joy in coming right. to the space is something that is, you know, just as sustainable as their physical practice. Right. All this segues really nicely into the next episode where we're going to be talking about context. Right. In other words, that pliable mindset that allows you to have a variety of physical practices and to be able to do those things with longevity. Good people, I'm Kenny Kane alongside Andy Galpin, and this has been The Body of Knowledge. The Body of Knowledge. The Body of Knowledge. The Looks like you enjoyed the show. Make sure to go over to iTunes, go over to Shrug Collective, give us a five-star review, positive comment only, and make sure to go over to thrivemarket.com slash body to order your groceries this week.